Hey guys, Political Junkie 2414 here, and welcome to my final prediction for the 2022 United States Senate elections. We are now just um, less than 24 hours away from the first polls closing at 6 o'clock on the East Coast. Uh, it's currently 9.30 um, on Monday, November 7th, um, 2022, when I'm recording this. I can't believe that it's this close. I know that it's this close, but I keep having to remind myself that, wow, we're finally here. I've been covering these midterms for, you know, the, you know, the better part of six months. Um, you know, I, I've been following them for the past two years. And, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how my predictions hold up and, you know, the governor, house, and senate prediction and senate elections. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's been really fun, you know, you know, I, and I really appreciate everyone who's, you know, stuck with me on this journey and, uh, you know, here's to many more years of, uh, following politics, you know, I'll be continuing into 2024 with the Senate races, the presidential election, the house races, and, you know, of course the governor's races next year and in 2024 and hopefully beyond that as well you know so anyways before we get into the final prediction i kind of want to give us a bit of a snapshot of how this year has gone so 2022 you know president biden being extremely unpopular and the democrats being the incumbent party in the white house and in congress you would figure republicans were going to have a pretty big big red wave and honestly they may and you know it looked like they really were after glenn youngkin's win in virginia um back in a uh, just just over a year ago, it looked really bad for the Democratic Party. They had lost a Biden plus ten state. Uh, you know, after you know by two points. Um, you know, and and yes, while it was a governor's race, uh, Terry McAuliffe was not really someone who had, who a lot of people had expected to lose. Glenn Youngkin, while he was a strong candidate, and I I thought he was personally, I never really thought that he was actually going to win. You know, I, I, well, obviously, you know, what I mean by that is like early on in the campaign season, for the record, I did eventually, you know, when, when it, you know, came election day, I did think that Youngkin was going to win, but, you know, it, it was in a really bad spot for the Democratic Party. They looked like they were in a position where the, a ha where a G, the, the GOP picking up the House was all but certain, and the Senate was extremely likely as well. The Senate, though, has been a lot more elastic. You know, in red wave years and in blue wave years, like 2010 and 2018, the incumbent party in the White House has been able to hold the Senate. In 2010, um, what ended up happening was the Democrats, um, because of their very large majority in, in the Senate, even though they lost seven seats overall, six in November and one uh, seat in Massachusetts in a special election uh, early that year, they were still able to hold uh, 53 seats, um, including the two independents that caucused with them at the time. And in uh, 2018, of course, the Senate map was so unfavorable to the Democratic Party that even though they did very well and won many competitive races, they still lost four of their seats while picking up two, but it was ultimately not enough for them to cancel out to, um, you know, to, uh, reclaim the Senate majority, even when they won, even when they picked up 40 seats in the House and, you know, flipped to Nevada and Arizona on the Senate level and flipped to multiple governorships. So the Senate has very much been immune to red and blue wave years. That being said, the Democrats have a razor-thin majority in the Senate. It's 50-50. Kamala Harris is the only reason why Democrats have control of the Senate. And in any type of midterm year, you would expect the GOP to be doing extremely well in the Senate. When I started out my predictions, I had the GOP favored 51-49, to 49, picking up Nevada and in, in, uh, Georgia, but uh, losing Pennsylvania. Since, you know, and, and after that, I, you know, I, um, you know, at, around the time of June, I moved the Senate into, um, you know, I moved, um, I said that, you know, my, my view had changed. The Democrats were now, in my opinion, you know, the favorites to win the Senate, and it, stick, and it stayed that way for a very long time. At one, at one point, you know, it was even, you know, 52 to 48 in, uh, you know, two months ago in September, when it looked like Mandela Barnes might actually win in Wisconsin. But, you know, as the Dobbs effect has kind of, you know, waned, it has, you know, definitely, you know, hurt the Democrats. And with Biden's approval rating dropping and with, um, you know, gas prices going back up and it just seeming to be a normal midterm year, 
you know, it looks like the Republicans are going to have at least somewhat of a good midterm after all. But then again, the polls have been underestimating Democrats by pretty significant margins, probably because of over overcompensation by pollsters for their 2020 misses. And while the Dobbs effect was very much alive and may still be alive, and anyone telling you that it's not or never was, you know, is simply lying to you, they, they're not, you know, they're not necessarily lying to you, but they're essentially denying reality that um, the overturning of Roe versus Wade, versus Wade didn't do anything. But at the end of the day, it seems like the Dobbs effect did not really, you know, it did not hold on long enough for Democrats to be able to have, uh, you know, a decent midterm, like a 1998 midterm. But then again, I could be wrong, you know, just like I said, the polls have been underestimating Democrats recently. So let's get into the predictions. So we're going to start by filling out the safe states for either party. These are the states um, that are going to go to either party by over 15 percentage points. They are extremely safe for either party. Um... But I will talk about um, two of the Republican states because some of them are, uh, because these two are uh, interesting. So the first one is Utah. Evan McMullen has been running a very interesting campaign against Mike Lee, who is not the most popular senator. Utah is a very traditionally Republican state, and while you would expect um, Lee, you know, you would expect um, Lee to be winning by 40 points, in some polls he's actually losing to McMullen. But Utah's polls have been very wonky. They underestimated Donald Trump by 10 points there in 2020, and Lee is up by around 10 points. I don't expect him to outperform Trump, but I expect him to win by close to 20 points. McMullen, while he is a strong candidate and, you know, has the backing of, um, in you know, conservative independents and the entirety of the Utah Democratic Party, he is still running in a state that Donald Trump won by 20 points and is still a red state at heart, even if it may not be the most accepting of the Trumpist wing of the GOP. And the second state is Alaska, where I am pretty confident that Lisa Murkowski is going to defeat Kelly Shabaka and win a second term. She won a writing campaign back in 2010, um, you know, running it for less than, uh, you know, two months uh, before the election. She waited um, weeks after the, after her primary loss. Uh, that year to actually make a decision and, you know, to make that decision. And she ended up winning and outperforming her polls by a lot. The ranked choice voting polls between Mary P uh, Peltola and Sarah Palin were very accurate. Um, you know, the Alaska survey research polls, and right now they show pretty um, solid resu results from Murkowski. And so I do believe that she is going to win by double digits against uh, Shabaka. Alaska is a very independent state very pro-choice. Murkowski has a lot of name recognition. She's going to get a lot of Democrats to her side, and the ranked choice voting uh, system doesn't hurt her either. So now we've got 12 uh, toss-up states. I, can, I guess you can say not all of them are the most competitive. These are the likely lean and tilt states. These are not, some of these states are not necessarily safe, but they are, you know, somewhat competitive. Others are, are you know, highly competitive. We're going to start off with the likely states, which are going to go to either party by um, margins between 5 and 15 points. They're not the most competitive, and in fact, most of them are, you know, um, functionally safe, but, you know, they will fall under the 15-point margin and are at least worth mentioning, um, you know. They're, they're at least worth some competitive um, ranking. The first one is... Uh, Washington, which is going to be a likely Democratic state. Patty Murray has really been underperforming, uh, you know, Joe Biden in the state. She, um, you know, had a pretty poor performance back in 2010 against her Republican opponent, Dino Rossi, um, you know, in which, and, you know, in 2010, she only won by five points against Rossi. Um, but Tiffany Smiley, you know, while she hasn't been running, you know, a bad campaign at all. She is still an underdog, you know, in a state that voted for Biden by 20 points. Murray, while she is a pretty underwhelming Democrat, is going to win her re-election nonetheless. The polls show it um, to only be about a five-point race, but you've got a lot of partisan pollsters from the GOP um, that are showing the race a lot closer than it will be. I believe that Murray's probably going to win by single digits at this point. It looks pretty clear to me. I think, you know, it's not very likely at all that, you know, it's a safe state anymore. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still Washington, and it's not going to go to Tiffany Smiley. It's still a, um, a blue state at heart. And even though Murray may not be the most popular, and Smiley is a good candidate, partisan politics are very, you know, very much indicative of how some of these, um, you know, very polarized states are going to go in this era of, of uh, politics. 
The second likeliest date for the Democrats is Colorado. Michael Bennett is on track for re-election. Joe O'Day is a very good candidate for the GOP, but he's running in a state that's um, trending extremely um, quickly to the left. And Jared Polis, as the incumbent governor on the ballot, is going to help Bennett. Um, you know, and, and the state is one where, you know, Colorado is a state where um, polls tend to underestimate Democratic support, not necessarily in Bennett's last election in 2016, but very much in 2010 when he was supposed to lose, but he ended up defeating his Republican challenger, Ken Buck. Um, and so while I think O'Day is a good candidate and he will outperform Donald Trump, you know, significantly, he's going to have um, some trouble getting turnout from the rural areas, but he will make pretty big improvements from Trump in these suburbs. So while Bennett is an electoral juggernaut, um, you know, he is probably, he's almost certainly going to underperform Biden, but I do still expect him to win by a fairly comfortable amount. I don't really expect the polls to really un be underestimating um, O'Day all that much, if at all. You know, I think that Bennett's on track for a seven to eight point victory right now in Colorado. Now we're going to go to the likely Republican states, of which there are just a few. Uh, Iowa is the first one. Chuck Grassley used to be an electoral juggernaut across the state, but the partisan, po you know, but as he's gotten older, his margins have begun to shrink, and he's facing an increasingly competitive, you know, his most competitive election since his initial one in 1980, this time around from Democrat Michael Franken. That being said, it's Iowa. It's still a very much, a, it's still very much a right trending state, but Grassley does not have the same crossover support that he once did. His age is clearly affecting him this time around. And Seltzer and Co., which is the most accurate pollster in Iowa, and it's actually uh, the best rated pollster in the country, rated by uh, 538. You know, on average, Grassley's up by 10 points. And while, you know, polls in Iowa tend to overestimate Democrats by quite a bit, um, you know, Seltzer and Co. was, you know, pretty accurate in 2020. They um, suggested a pretty hefty margin for Trump when everyone, when every other pollster was, you know, every nonpartisan pollster was pretty much saying that the race was a dead heat. They have Grassley up by 12. That is under 15 points. And I think that that's a pretty reasonable margin. You know, Seltzer is not perfect all the time, but they are very accurate in the state of Iowa. And I would bet on that. Um, right now, you know, I know that polls are not everything, but Seltzer is a very is very much, you know, not a pollster that you really want to argue against. And Iowa's partisan politics is going to pull Grassley over the fin over the finish line. But I do expect if he does run again in twenty twenty eight, if he is still in the Senate, um, for his margin to once again get smaller. He is clearly becoming less and less popular with Iron with uh, the state, you know, with his um constituents who really did not want him to to run for an eighth term, but they're still going to re-elect him nonetheless. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the second likely state we have is Florida. Marco Rubio is easily going to win his re-election against Val Demings, even though the Democrats, you know, put up a good candidate in Demings. She simply does not have what it takes to um, defeat an electoral juggernaut like Marco Rubio, who's going to do very well with Hispanic voters. And, you know, with the um, turnout in Florida looking really bad for the Democrats this year, I really don't see um, a path for Rubio to win the race by anywhere, you know, below eight points. I think that he's going to win by more 10 or 11 points. But I do think that um, overall, you know, despite his, um, you, know, you know, his very strong margins of Hispanics, he's probably going to underperform Ron DeSantis based on the fact that Demings will be able to get some good turnout from the Orlando area with some uh, minority voters, you know, because she's from there, she's a black woman. And I do think that she, you know, if she wasn't running against Rubio, she would have a much better shot against someone like uh, Rick Scott. So, uh, yeah, Florida is pretty clearly a likely Republican state, honestly, more, you know, honestly, you know, functionally, it's a safe state, but at the end of the day, it's going to be under 15 points. I think it'll be around a, um, an 11, a 10 or 11 point victory for Marco Rubio. The next likely state we have is North Carolina. This is a change from last time I had it as lean. Sherry Beasley, while she is a very strong candidate and she is going to do better than the average Democrat would do with Black Turnit in a midterm year, she's still running against a very, or not not a, a super good candidate, but a decent opponent in Ted Budd. And North Carolina is a state that hasn't elected a Democrat, um, you know, that hasn't voted for a Democrat for president or for, or, you know, has elected a, a Democrat to the U.S. Senate since 2008. And I don't really expect that, that to change this time. Yes, uh, Beasley you know, North Carolina is a state that's becoming more democratic, and Beasley is very much 
an electoral juggernaut, but she really, you know, is running in the wrong year at the wrong time against the wrong candidate. If Pat McCroy had been the GOP nominee for this race, I think that it would have had a much better chance of going to Beasley. You know, she's a very strong candidate, but the black turnout is not where it needs to be for her right now. And polls in North Carolina tend to be pretty wacky with Democratic support, not like um, the polls in the Rust Belt are like in Ohio and Wisconsin, but they are still not the best. So I do expect Ted Budd to win by around five points. I think he's up by four right now. And um, oh, and by the way, I have um, a, I made some adjusted polling averages based on the 2020 miss in each of these states. Um, and in, in North Carolina, I put in the 538 average, um, Bud's up by 4.3. Oddly enough, um, in my um, adjusted average, he's up by a 0.2% less, which I don't really believe in a state that underestimates Republicans like North Carolina. But, you know, it's uh, it's an interesting result. I could see it being lean, but right now, out of, you know, um, you know, out of caution, it, well, not out of caution, but necess not, nece not necessarily that, but in terms of polling errors and also the fact that Ted Budd really doesn't seem to be, you know, it doesn't really seem like Beasley is getting that great of turnout from the, you know, is doing, you know, in, you know, that that much better than the average Democrat would do with black turnout in, you know, a midterm year. I do think that he's going to win by around five and a half, six percent. <clears throat> and the final likely state we have is the state of Ohio. J.D. Vance, while he is one of the worst candidates that the, the GOP nominated this cycle and Tim Ryan is one of the best for the Democrats, Ohio is still a right trending state. It is still a state where polls are acutely wrong, you know, or not acutely wrong, but are, you know, you know, embarrassingly wrong. You know, no matter what the year is, I don't believe that they're going to be as wrong this year. But Tim Ryan has really lost his edge in the polling. He's a very strong candidate, and I think that there's a good chance that he does outperform Joe Biden. It is interesting, um, when I went to um Matt, you know, when I went to adjust the average, there was actually no difference between, um, you know, the uh, 538 average and the adjusted average, which pretty much, you know, suggests that maybe Ohio's polls have gotten a lot better. But honestly, I do expect Ryan to pretty much run even with Joe Biden, which is good, you know, considering the fact that, you know, um, 2022 is a much better year than 2020, you know, and while Vance is a really bad candidate, and I always expected Ryan to outperform Biden, you know, it's still a decent showing nonetheless if he doesn't lose by double digits. Um, you know, Vance, at the end of the day, if he was running in a year like 2018, Tim Ryan would probably be beating him. Ryan's going to do really well with white working class voters, but at the end of the day, the national partisanship and the national environment is not going to be enough for him to flip Ohio blue. It's a sad story. I really like Tim Ryan, but at the end of the day, it doesn't look like he's going to win. So now we have six toss-up states, which are going to be the most competitive. Uh, these are going to be the lean or tilt states. We'll start with the lean states, which are going to go to either party by um, between 1% to 5%. These states are not necessarily set in stone for either party. You know, they have a very good chance of going the in the other direction, but they are at the same time, you know, they, they are at the same time fairly solid predictions for um, either party. So we have one for each... Um, we have a state for um each party um for the democrats their lean their um lone lean state is the state of new hampshire don boldeck has been doing a lot better than i expected i really did underestimate him but maggie hassan is still an electoral juggernaut who beat a very popular republican incumbent kelly ayat in 2016. and while new hampshire's polls were kind of wonky in 2020 we have to remember that 2020 was not, the, you know, was not, um, you know, it was a very unique um, year for polling misses. And that doesn't necessarily mean that Hassan is, you know, not vulnerable. She absolutely, she absolutely is. And Bulldog's chances are a lot higher than they were just a month ago. It surprises me how much he's caught up. But at the end of the day, most pollsters do still show Hassan ahead. She's a very strong incumbent. And while she could lose, I do think, you know, that her status, you know, being a pretty, um, you know, strong incumbent in New Hampshire, even if she's not that popular, is going to get her over the finish line. She's been able to win in red wave years before. And now our um, lone lean Republican state, this is a change from last time. It is the state of Wisconsin. As you can see, Wisconsin and North Carolina trade places as lean and likely are states. Ron Johnson is very much on track for re-election. And while I do think that he could very well win by a, um, you know, by over 5%, Mandela Barnes, 
you know, he may not be a very strong candidate for the Democrats. And, you know, it really, you know, it really does pain me to see how quickly he dropped in the polling, you know, and how much and how effective Johnson's slandering of Barnes worked, because, you know, I really do not, I really dislike Ron Johnson. And I was very excited when I saw Mandela Barnes leading in that Trafalgar poll back at the end of August. But at the end of the day, um, you know, while Barnes has kind of had a bit of a resurgence in the polling data, he's still down by 3.3%. And while Wisconsin's polls are a lot better in midterm years than they are in uh, presidential years, I do think that there's going to be like maybe a one, one and a half point polling miss. And so Johnson's going to win by just under five points. You know, if, if Johnson had, you know, if um, Republicans, uh, if Johnson had decided to retire like he originally planned to in 2016, or at least that's what he said, I do think the Barnes would have a much better chance. But Johnson, while he's not the most popular incumbent, he has a way of rallying behind the base and Mandela Barnes just does not have um, you know, the energy at, you know, he doesn't have the wind at his back like he did during, like he did during the summertime. So I do think that Wisconsin goes to Ron Johnson by around five points. Um, so give me a second. Do something for my cat. All right, so now we're down to the four most competitive states. These are the true toss-up states. They're going to be decided by under one percentage point. Um, these are the tilt states. These could really go in either direction. They are the, you know, these are not solidified predictions. If we look, Republicans are leading with 49 Senate seats, just two away from the, from the 51 seats they need to reclaim the majority, while Democrats need to, um, are at 47 seats and need to win three of these four races. <clears throat> you know, and so we could end up seeing a net gain right now of Republicans, you know, according to my prediction so far and looking at these four toss-up states, you know, all of these states are in the margin of error to either deliver a net gain of free seats for the GOP or net gain of one for the Democratic Party if they hold on to all of to Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and pick up Pennsylvania. So we're going to, you know, in these states, I am not super confident about, and I could easily be wrong about many of them, if not all of them. But I am going to give them a shot anyway. And, you know, I've been pretty confident with my predictions in the past, though I will admit that I, you know, would not be surprised if I got these states wrong in the slightest. So we're going to go from east to west. We're going to start with Nevada, then go down to Arizona, then move over to Pennsylvania, and finally end off in Georgia. So Nevada, I do believe, is going to go to Adam Laxalt. Um, John Ralston, who's, you know, a pretty um, famous, uh, well, not super famous, but he's a, um, a political analyst of Nevada, you know, in Nevada, you know, he's um, pretty well known for his takes on Nevada being pretty accurate. He's, you know, been in the business for a long time. He's come out and said that the early vote numbers, you know, which are pretty, you know, vague, do not, that he doesn't think that they're going to, you know, they don't look too great for Democrats. And that, you know, Clark County turnout's not going to be that great. Rural turnout's not going to be super great. And so Washoe County, which is the county up here near Reno in the northwestern part of the state, is going to be the deciding area. And so I really could see this race going either way. Again, Nevada's polls do skew towards Republicans. But at the end of the day, I do think that, um, you know, Adam Laxalt is going to be able to defeat Catherine Cortez Masto and break the Democrats' uh, monopoly on power in the state of Nevada. I think that Joe Lombardo is certainly going to help him um, by beating St Steve Sislak in the governor's race, um, which I think is um, going to happen, you know, even if Cortez Masto does pull off an upset, although, you know, it's not impossible the Democrats hold on to the governorship if they do have a um, better night than expected. But at the end of the day, a lot of the data, a lot of the, you know, situations in Nevada with the economy, with inflation, with abortion being already legal in the state and, you know, vote suburban voters not really seeming to care all that much about the issue, all, le all points to a Republican victory. And at the end of the day, we can't guarantee that there is not another polling miss. Um, you know, in the state of Nevada, I understand that Adam, that Laxalt won his attorney general's race by a hair's margin in 2014, a red wave year when Nevada was, um, you know, voted pretty Republican. You know, they reelected Brian Sandoval, the, their, the, um, incumbent Republican governor at the time by a large margin. And, you know, I also know that 
Laxalt lost in 2018 to Steve Sisolak, but at the, at the end of the day, Nevada is a state that's trending somewhat rightward, and it's voting to the voting more Republican than the rest of the country, or, you know, that's, that's you know, it's more recently been voting more, um, to the right of the country as a whole. And so I do believe that while Cortez Mosto is a strong incumbent and can get a good Hispanic turnout, I don't believe that it's going to be enough to save her in a state where, you know, Hispanics are trending rightward and with his uh, suburban voters looking like they're going to, um, looking like the GOP is going to perform pretty well with suburban voters this year in the Silver State. So Nevada is a state um, that the GOP flips. In Arizona, I do still believe that Mark Kelly is going to hold on against Blake Masters, although again, I could be very wrong. Arizona's polls, you know, have been getting better for Masters, but at the end of the day, he's not having the same surge that Dr. Oz had. Oz really narrowed up the race super close in Pennsylvania, and while Kelly's in a pretty tight race as well, and, you know, if you applied the 2020 polling miss, uh, Masters would be up then, but only one poll, and I guess you can count the Emerson poll, even though, you know, on 538, for some reason, it has it as tied. Yes, Masters, you know, has now led in a poll, but this is data for progress. It is, you know, the Mark Molinaro plus eight poll in that special election, and we all know that how that turned out. Um, Arizona's polls um, historically have underestimated Democratic support. Uh, I know that, you know, polling misses are not the most, you know, um, accurate representation and that they do change. You know, it is not set in stone that one party is going to be underestimated or overestimated. But I think at the end of the day, Kelly is no pushover. Blake Masters is not a great candidate for the GOP, and he hasn't been able to do nearly as well as, say, Herschel Walker, Adam Laxalt, Mehmet Oz, or J.D. Vance have been able to do. I still think that he has a very good chance, and I could be proven wrong, but I do think at the end of the day, he's not getting enough good turnout in the suburbs, and Arizona is like a state that likes to ticket split. You know, Cary Lake doesn't really seem to be pulling masters over the finish line. So, you know, out of an abundance of caution, I could see, you know, masters winning, but right now I'm going to put it as tilted Democratic, although I wouldn't be surprised if Kelly outperformed my expectations and won by a lean margin. You know, he's very popular. He's got a lot of name recognition in the state of Arizona, and he's a very, you know, he's a pretty strong incumbent. So, yeah, that is where I stand on Arizona. In Pennsylvania, and this is going to give the GOP their, uh, the uh, majority, I still believe that Dr. Oz is going to win. Um, he has taken the lead in the 538 aggregate. And what's interesting is that in my adjusted polling average, um, and by the way, I forgot, to, I keep forgetting to mention this, Kelly was up by three points in my polling average, so that kind of um, tells you about, you know, um, Arizona polls underestimating Democratic support, and in Nevada, Black Salt's up by 0.4. Anyways, after all that rambling, let's go down to Pennsylvania. What's odd is that even though Oz has now taken the lead in the uh, 538 aggregate, my polling uh, average, my adjusted average, which uh, froze out a lot of the partisan polls, has Fetterman plus one. Or Fetterman up by one. And while I do think that, you know, Democrats have a very good shot at Pennsylvania, and they need it to win the Senate, unless they do pull off an upset in Nevada, I do think, you know, in, in Nevada and, you know, win Georgia, but I do think that right now Dr. Oz has a lot of the momentum. Pennsylvania polls are not the, you know, are, are not super inaccurate, but Oz is already up, and, you know, in 2020, um, Pennsylvania, you know, in, in, you know, recent years, Pennsylvania's polls have been off by two to three points. I don't think they're going to be off by that much this time. And, um, you know, let's actually look at the RCP average right now, because they were, um, pretty much spot on in 2020. Um, you know, do they have Oz up? They have Oz up by 0.1%. So, you know, I think that's a pretty accurate result. I know that Oz is not a good candidate for the rural areas and that Fetterman is a pretty strong candidate. But at the end of the day, his medical issues are still going to hurt him, and Oz has definitely consolidated the Republican base. Fetterman also, you know, consolidated the, the Democrats um, very early on. But at the end of the day, I do think that Oz pulls out a narrow, narrow margin in Pennsylvania and is elected the first Pennsylvanian senator from New Jersey, uh, pun intended. Um, so, uh, yeah, that is it for Pennsylvania. And finally, Georgia. I think that we are pretty clearly headed for a runoff election. Uh, you know, I don't think that Raphael Warnock or Herschel, nor Herschel Walker is going to get over 50% tomorrow. I could be wrong. I could see Walker, you know, get, um, winning outright, although that's not very likely. 
but I, call, I could also see Warnock winning outright, which I think is more likely, but I still would bet on a runoff occurring. There's really not that much data that points to Georgia, you know, going, you know, you know, avoiding a runoff. Herschel Walker is currently leading the polling aggregate, and polls in Georgia are pretty accurate, but a lot of these um, pollsters recently that have had Walker up are, you know, Republican internals, which overestimated Trump by a lot in the state in 2020. And I do think that the enthusiasm factor will hurt Raphael Warnock in the, um, you know, could hurt Warnock in the runoff election. The demographics are still very much um, beneficial to him. And while, you know, Walker is definitely underperforming Brian Kemp by a lot. I do think that, you know, with Kemp, you know, looking like he is going to easily win outright um, tomorrow night, I really do think that in a runoff election that would hurt Walker. You know, I think that even, you know, I do think that if Georgia is inconsequential to the Senate majority, it could very well, you know, um, I think it's going to hurt both sides with turnout. Um, obviously, the GOP would definitely have that advantage, but Democrats would still be very much fighting for this seat, you know, especially when you consider that all of the other races would be done. So I think that while Walker has a very good chance at pulling off a win in the state of Georgia, I do still believe that Raphael Warnock will win, a, you know, a runoff by a very slim margin. I could be very wrong. I do think that Georgia right now is looking like a pure toss-up in, you know, for the tomorrow, for um, the election day vote tomorrow. But I do think that in a runoff, Warnock would benefit from lower GOP turnout. You know, I do think that also, you know, Walker's going to not great get great turnout from the rural areas. Not necessarily, um, you know, because he's a bad, well, I mean, he's a bad candidate uh, very much. But, um, you know, objectively and also in my opinion. Um, but, you know, I, I think Walker, you know, he's going to have a hard time with getting a lot of um, pro-life voters onto his side. Not, well, I mean, not onto his side. Obviously, they're going, you know, they're going to vote for him. They're not going to vote for Warnock, but I could see the Libertarian getting a lot of um, rural voters to come to his side and pulling away from Walker. Um, and I also think that, you know, Walker, I do think, will say more things and more scandals will come out about him in the coming month, which will screw him over in um, a runoff election. Although, again, the scandals, um, unfortunately for Raphael Warnock, are not seeming to really matter that much to Walker's performance in Georgia. You know, it, he is still a Republican in a swing state. But Georgia has been trending heavily to the left, and I don't expect um, black turnout to really drop all that much, you know, even when Democrats do, you know, have an enthusiasm problem in the runoff in Georgia. So, my final Senate map for the 2022 United States Senate elections is 51 Republicans, um, you know, Republican senators, and 49 Democratic senators. The GOP hold on, holds on to all of their seats and pick up Nevada, which gives them a net gain of one, breaking the tie, or, you know, not breaking the tie, but erasing the 50-50 tie that Vice President Harris has been breaking in favor of the Democratic Party for the last couple of years. Democrats hold on to their competitive states, um, to their competitive races in Colorado, New Hampshire, Georgia, and Arizona, while Republicans hold on to Wisconsin, Ohio, North Carolina, Florida, Pennsylvania, and flip Nevada. And I guess you can also say Democrats hold on to Washington, but that's not really a super competitive race. And I guess you could also say Iowa, you know, but that's pretty obvious as well. So anyways, guys, this is my final prediction. I hope you guys have really enjoyed the ride that we have had. I'm really excited to see how the results pan out tomorrow night. I will, you know, make a video later on in the week, um, probably, maybe not on Wednesday, because I have a lot going on that day, it's gonna be pretty busy, but hopefully on Thursday, or, you know, whenever I get a good chance, I will review the 2022 results with you guys, and I will make a video explain, you know, pretty much going over how accurate or inaccurate my predictions were. I really hope, you know, that I get a lot of these states right, I am sure that I will get at least one of them wrong, which one that will be. I am not sure, but I'm ready to face it. I am ready to face the shame that comes with getting something wrong. But at the end of the day, it's been really fun, and I really look forward to seeing the results. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure to like and sub like the video and subscribe. Sh uh, share the video, turn on notifications so you don't miss another one. Check out my non-political channel, Interactor127, and my uh, you know my comrades channel, Garlands is 666. 
It's been a long journey. I'm looking forward to 2024 until, you know, pretty much just reflecting on these midterms in a couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, it's been a long journey, guys. And I'm sad. I'm really sad to see, you know, it come to a close. I, I, I can't believe that we're here. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's quite sad. But at the same time, it feels just right. So I'll see you guys next time when I talk about all things politics. See ya.